Let me welcome this morning Dr. Tony Campolo to Kingsway. I'm glad to be here, but at my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. I, I got to tell you that I, I've gotten really old. I, I go to weddings and the bride's grandmother looks better to me than the bride. You know, then you know you're old. Uh, I, uh, I came in today and I didn't expect to see any people that I knew, but I, I ran across three people who were familiar. And it's not always, it's not always good to see uh, familiar faces, you know. I, I, and, and I hate it when somebody comes up to me and says, do you remember me? <laughs> I never knew how to answer that until about, oh, about a year ago. A woman came up to me after a service and said, do you remember me? And in a moment of divine inspiration, I said, madam, in order to get any work done, I had to put you out of my mind. I talked to my wife on the phone this morning. She says, how do you feel? I said, you know how I feel. I'm always nervous when I get up to speak. And she says, when you get up to speak, God gets nervous. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I want to talk about the love of God. When they asked Jesus, uh, what's it all about? Can you reduce your message to a soundbite, to put it in modern terms? I mean, all of these laws, all of the prophets, they've said so many wonderful things. But if you had to reduce it to a one line, a one sentence, what would that be? Uh, Jesus said, well, the, the, it reduces itself to this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like an unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Do this, everything else will take care of itself. Love God like you should. Love other people like you should. All will be well. All will be well. That is the message of the gospel. That God loves us and he calls us to love him back. To love. It sounds like such an easy thing to do. But that's because our culture is very much into romanticism. We're romantic people. That's the Western culture. Uh, romance is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It gets you married. I mean, when I got married, I'm not sure I understood anything about love. I did understand romance. I was turned on. I, I mean, you know, uh, uh, romance. It's a great emotion. It, it isn't love. Love is much deeper than romance. As a matter of fact, romanticism, say the sociologists, and I'm one of them, diminishes in intensity about 80% over the first two years of marriage. You say, not if you marry the right one. That's enough to make you puke, isn't it? I mean, the right one. So you ask your mother, Mom, how will I know when I've met the right one? And every mother in Canada answers exactly the same way. When you meet the right one, that clarifies everything, doesn't it? That really clarifies. You'll know. And, and it, does, it doesn't end there, people. Uh, two weeks before the wedding, she looks at you and says, Are you sure? It's too late. The invitations are out. The presents are coming in. You're dead meat. I don't know what it's like to come down the aisle. I know what it's like to be up front and look out there and everybody you ever knew is in the congregation. And this woman dressed in white is coming down the aisle, coming at you. And on, on this occasion, you hardly recognize her. And she's wearing this demonic grin on her face. And you're saying, God, what am I doing here? And even if you are an agnostic, you will hear a voice from heaven saying, too late, sucker. It's over. It's over. I always tell my students at Eastern University where I teach, all that a wedding does is creates the possibility for a marriage. Those of you who have been married a long time, you know what I'm talking about. Marriage is what you create when the romanticism dies down. You say, it won't die down. You wake up one morning and look across the bed. She's not awake. Her mouth is open. The hair's hanging down over her face. Worse than that, she wakes up first and looks across the bed. <laughs> and there is no hair hanging down. <laughs> romanticism. Love is much deeper than romanticism. Uh, Eric Fromm, uh, 
hardly a Christian, but wrote, I think, one of the best books on, on love. And he himself admits that the energy that is required for love is something that he doesn't know anything about. He knows love when he sees it, but he doesn't know where the energy comes from. There is a spiritual energy that you need to love. Eric Fromm talks about the fact that without that energy, that inner spiritual, he calls it psychic energy, I call it spiritual energy, you can't really connect with people. You say, what does that mean? I just finished my lecturing at the University of Pennsylvania. I, I was going to get, get my car. I got to the corner of 34th and Spruce Street. I'm waiting for the traffic light to change, and I heard the duck lady coming, a schizophrenic woman who wandered around the campus, quacking, incessantly quacking, never stopped quacking for a moment. Quack, 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 quack. She came right alongside of me. There were about 20 students gathered around. We were all together, and she's quacking and quacking and quacking. I turned to her, and at that moment, she turned to me, and our eyes met. And with all the spiritual energy, with all the spiritual energy within me, I looked into her. Let me repeat that. Looked into her. Not at her, but into her. The Apostle Paul writes in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we look at each other as though through a glass darkly. We look at each other. I got married because when I looked at my wife, she looked good. She turned me on. We look at each other through a glass darkly. But when you're energized with the spirit, you're able to look into a person. And I did. I didn't look at the duck lady. I looked into her eyes. And with all the energy and power of the Holy Spirit, I reached through her eyes and down into the depths of her being and connected with the essence, the essence of her personhood. I connected with her soul. Jesus said, the eyes are the entrance to the body. If people shut off their eyes, then they are in darkness, and the only question is how deep is that darkness? Her eyes were open in this spiritual way, and I, I was able not only to look at her, and, but able to reach through her eyes and down to the depths of her being and connect. When I teach my students at a university, I, I look at these young people, 19, 20, 21 years of age, and I look at them and I say, do you even have a hint of what I'm talking about when I say there's a difference between looking at as opposed to looking into? Do you know what it's like to be spiritually empowered to reach through a person's eyes and down into the depths of that being and connect and connect? And feel what Martin Buber, the Hasidic philosopher, once said, an I-thou relationship. You touch something sacred in the innermost recesses of the other person. I often ask married couples, when was the last time you looked into each other? One of the things I would do when I was teaching uh, freshmen in the university was uh, give them an assignment to go to a restaurant and observe people. And they were always upset when they came back because they were amazed at how little married couples looked into each other's eyes. They looked around, they looked hither, they looked yon, but they didn't look into each other. Look into each other. We see each other through a glass darkly, but then, when the Spirit empowers us, and I reached into the depths of the being of the duck lady. She stopped her quacking. I couldn't believe it. Nobody had ever known her to stop her quacking. She stopped, and she looked around with an an air of wonder, and she said, it's lovely. It's really quite lovely. And before I could answer, the traffic light changed, and the students around us brushed by and bumped her and bumped me. When they bumped her, I watched her head snap, and she fell back into her schizophrenic state again, and she started quacking again. Quack, 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 and she crossed the street and disappeared into the crowd, and I stood there asking myself, I wonder if I had held on to her in that intimate, loving manner for, for a minute, maybe two or three minutes, maybe five minutes, if we had stayed connected spiritually for five minutes, maybe the deliverance would not have been just momentary. 
Maybe it would have been ongoing. You say, hey, Campolo, you're a social scientist. Don't you believe in psychiatry and psychotherapy? And the answer is, of course I do. But after they have pulled all that they know, after they've tried everything they've been trained to try, and nothing's changed, you need not give up. The Bible says there is still a bomb in Gilead. There is still a hailing power out there. There is a healing power, and it's something that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. If you read in the fifth chapter of, of Galatians, it says, and the fruits of the Spirit are these, and number one on the list is love. This energy to love. You say, where does that energy come from? Well, I, I, I wondered a long time. I, and when I was in high school, there was this girl that was Pentecostal. She seemed to have the energy of God. Man, those Pentecostals, they got it. So one night I went to our Pentecostal church and the preacher invited everybody down the aisle who wanted to be filled with the Spirit. I went down and this preacher went down and hitting people on the head. Have you ever seen that? You can, Benny Hinn does that, hits people on the head. You've seen it? And everybody he hit fell over, unconscious. Boom, 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 boom. And I stood there and he came and he hit me and nothing happened. He moved on and knocked over some other people. Then he came back and he hit me again. <laughs> Nothing. And people, I really wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Incredibly. And, and I think that's a valid thing that those people are into. I, it's not my DNA. But there's something going on in the Pentecostal community that you cannot ignore. It's wonderful. There are people who are filled with the Spirit. I wanted to be filled with the Spirit. It was a Catholic friend that helped me. He gave me a book of a medieval saint, uh, St. Ignatius. Uh, the book was entitled The Spiritual Exercises, and I learned a new way of praying. See, I am Baptist. You don't have to be Baptist to go to heaven, amen? amen. But why take a chance? <laughs> and I grew up Baptist, and I knew how to pray Baptist, and you know how Baptists pray? We ask for stuff. That's what we think prayer is. Lord, give us this. Give us that. Give me the spirit. Uh, give, a, give my wife healing. Uh, uh, take care of this. Take, we order God around. We come to God with a list of non-negotiable demands. We're sometimes like my son when he was seven years old coming into the living room and saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? We laugh, but I got to ask you, aren't our prayers simply a sophisticated version of that? Treating God as some kind of transcendental Santa Claus that, uh, that will, will give us what we, we want as long as we end the prayer right. I remember my mother saying, be sure to end the prayer in Jesus' name, because you got to say that at the end or you won't. Oh, come on. I can just imagine God saying, I wanted to heal that person of cancer, but they didn't end the prayer right. Gee, you know, come on. God's not waiting to be informed. You, as you say, dear Lord, Sister Mary is sick in the hospital. What do you think God's saying? Whoa, I didn't know that. Which hospital? I, I, God is God. He knows what you need. This is in Scripture before you even ask. I still make my request known unto God, but it's to establish my dependency on God, not to inform God. But there's another way of praying. And it's my Catholic friend with his friend, book from St. Ignatius that helped me. I wake up in the morning before I have to. And I lie in bed in absolute stillness. And in the quietude of the morning, I center down on Jesus. It takes me at least 15 minutes to get rid of the animals. C.S. Lewis said, the animals are the 101 things that come in and take possession of your brain the minute you wake up. Isn't that the way we all are? We wake up in the morning, we start thinking, it's Thursday, what do I have to do today? What, what, what's on the agenda today? We think of all the things that have to be done and, and our head starts spinning. Our head becomes like a beehive thinking about all the things that lie ahead that need to be addressed that day. And you got to get rid of the animals. And it takes me 15 minutes to push them all aside so that the only thing that's in my mind is Jesus. I say his name over and over again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Say it with such intensity. You say, why do you do that? 
Because in the words of my friend Bill Gaither, there's something about the name. I don't know what it is. There's, there's something mystical. It drives back the animals and creates what the ancient Celtic Christians called the thin place. What a poetic statement. The thin place. Where the wall between God and you becomes so thin that he can break through and envelop you. It takes me 15 minutes of quietude and stillness, focusing on Jesus. And then, and then I just surrender. I don't ask God for anything. They asked Mother Teresa once, when you pray, what do you say to God? She said, I don't say anything. I listen. So Dan Rather, the interviewer, said, oh, oh okay. <laughs> when you pray, what does God say to you? She said, God doesn't say anything. God listens. <laughs> and then she added, if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. I do understand a kind of praying where you say nothing and hear nothing, but in quietude and in stillness, you surrender and you wait. You wait for the Holy Spirit to flow into you. You know that verse from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles and fly. You, you, you know that passage. When was the last time you waited? Come on. You start the prayer, dear God, and he's supposed to show up instantaneously. And when you finish the prayer, you dismiss him with, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. That's it. When was the last time in quietude and in stillness you simply emptied yourself of everything except Jesus and waited for him to invade you, to flow into you, to come alive inside of you? I wish I could say every morning this wonderful thing happens. As a matter of fact, it took me weeks before it happened at all. And it doesn't happen all the time. Statistically, sociologists do this. It comes out about one out of every five times. I feel myself being penetrated, being invaded by the Holy Spirit and feeling the Spirit of God come alive in me. They who wait upon the Lord. You've got to wait. You've got to be patient. You've got to wait. I remember one day I, I had a particularly good morning and I really felt the Spirit of God invade me, fill me. Why was I electric? I was energized. I, I went to catch an airplane to go out to Chicago for a speaking engagement and I got to the airport late and they gave me a middle seat. And there were fat guys on either side of me <laughs> and they squeezed me and they had already claimed the armrests. Nobody talks about that. But there is a subtle battle that goes on in every airplane as people see, figures out who's going to get the armrests. They had them on both sides. I'm squeezed. And the guy next to me is upset. He's wearing a T-shirt. I can feel the tension in his arm. He's, he's got perspiration. He's biting on his thumb. And he's upset. I, now I know being Baptist, you're probably able to turn and say, excuse me, sir, you're, you're troubled. You need the four spiritual laws. Here they are. And had them saved and sanctified before the plane landed in Chicago. I, I'm not very good at that. But that particular day, I was really alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. I didn't say anything. I just leaned on him. And I let the power of the Holy Spirit flow. You say, wait a minute, Camp Paulo. You may be a Baptist, but you're sounding Pentecostal. You act as though the Holy Spirit is some kind of energy force that flies from God into the believer and then can flow out of the believer to another person. Exactly. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's more than a theology. There is a power there. That's what the Apostle Paul writes, the power of God. And I had it that day. So I let him have it all the way to Chicago. And when the plane touched down, I said, Lord, if you want me to talk to this guy, you're going to have to give me a sign. Now there is a stupid theology. <laughs> a sign. I don't know what I was expecting. The flight attendant turning into an armadillo. I don't know. I want, a, I want a sign. No sooner I said that than this guy turned to me. He said, mister, uh, I'm in deep trouble. I need God. <laughs> I was hoping for something more specific, you know. I, we went into the cafeteria at O'Hare, and over the next hour, I was able to lead him into a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But hear me, people. 
it wasn't because I went to an evangelism training course or I, I had the right way to say it. In the words of the Apostle Paul, I came not with excellency of words, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. To come in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to concentrate, which is the first element of love, according to Eric Fromm, you have to be empowered. And I don't know any other source of power except the, the energy that comes when the Holy Spirit flows into you. You who were once dead, you who had no power, you hath he quickened. You hath he poured the power into. Is the power of Christ alive in you? Well, it can be. I don't knock the Pentecostal way of doing it because it works for those people. It just didn't work for me, that's all. But I do what Blaise Pascal did, the greatest intellect in the last thousand years, according to Einstein. This uh, man that lived in the 1500 one night goes into a dark room, turns, sits in a chair in the darkness, starting at seven o'clock at night, determined to wait and focus upon Jesus like I've been telling you. Wait and wait. He writes in his diary the next day, 10.30 p.m., fire, fire, fire. Not the God of the philosophers or the theologians, not the God of the mathematicians or the astronomers, but the God that was alive in Abraham, Moses, and Jacob. Fire, 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 joy, 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 fire, joy, fire, joy, 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 joy. The fullness of joy. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want more than just an orthodox theology? Do you think that being a Christian is having your doctrine straight? Or is it allowing Christ to invade you? Allowing his spirit to take possession of you? Enter into you? Fill you with an energy that the world couldn't possibly understand? An energy that enables you to connect with people. To connect with that person you're married to. To connect with your friends, to be able to look into people and have what Martin Buber called an I-thou relationship. The person is no longer an it. The person has become a sacred thou. The second cons constituent element of, of love is, is concern. Is concern. When the Spirit of God is in you, when Christ has taken possession of you, there is an intense concern that is generated. I I know this, I, I, I know that in my own life, the more I'm surrendered to Christ, the more I'm sensitive to people a, a, around me. Uh, I, uh, I was in a little tiny air terminal in Farmington, New Mexico, small town, little terminal for the airplanes. Uh, a, a commuter flight flew in from Denver, Colorado, three times a, a day and picked up people and took them to the main airport in Denver. I'm waiting there for, for this little commuter plane to land. A little tiny place, and there were about 10 people there. I, and there was this elderly woman. And she was sitting there with this mean look on her face. Almost scary to look at her. I didn't have anything else to do. So I went over and I sat next to her. And I was determined to get her to smile. I pulled every funny thing I could think of out of my hat. Told jokes and I did get her to smile. And then I got her to laugh and when she started laughing, eight guys in the place, we all gathered around her. And they started joking and, and she started laughing and harder and harder. And she said, please stop. I'm an old lady. You got me laughing too hard. You have no idea what could happen. <laughs> the little airplane landed. Her friend got off the plane, came into the terminal. She hugged her friend. They left. I was waiting for them to call us to go through the metal detector. When I looked out the glass doors of this little terminal, I saw her car coming back up the drive. The car stopped in front of the terminal. She got out. She shuffled slowly back into the terminal, and she came up to me, and she said, Mister, 
You could not have known this. But it was two years ago today that my husband of 64 years died. Two years ago today. You didn't know that. But it was on the way home that I realized that today was the first day since then that I've been able to laugh. And I had to come back and say thank you. You say, so big deal. You got a little old lady to laugh. You're talking about the work of Jesus. Jesus said, the work that I do, ye shall do, and greater works than ye shall you do, because I go unto my Father. Well, let me ask you something. If Jesus had a choice between walking on water and getting a broken-hearted old lady to laugh again, which do you think he would call the greater thing, the greater work? Which of the two? Mother Teresa said it well. We all cannot do great things, but we all can do small things with great love. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to fill you with the Spirit so that in the ordinary engagements of life, in the ordinary fellowships of everyday existence, the love of God will flow out of you and, and touch another person. It's only in the context of love that your witness of the gospel is going to make any sense at all. To run through the four spiritual laws, to tell people they're sinners and that Jesus died on the cross, to deliver them. From, it's not going to click unless they feel themselves enveloped by love that comes from God and flows through you and envelops the other person. Concern. Concern. It's so important. I uh, have a friend. He's one of the premier speakers in the United States. He's a school teacher. He won the award of Teacher of the Year for the state of Minnesota. From there, he went on to win the Teacher of the Year for the whole United States of America. The best teacher in America that year, voted by his colleagues. He went to the White House to get his award. I asked him, Guy, you're such an excellent English teacher. Why did you become an English teacher? Why did you choose to be an English teacher? He said, when I was in the eighth grade, I was horribly overweight. The fat just hung over from my body. I was embarrassed when people looked at me, and I felt ashamed. When I was in the eighth grade, the teacher said, well, next year you'll be in high school. We began to ask, what will that be like? And among the things she said was this. Well, on Friday each week, you're going to go down for physical education, gym. And you'll go to the locker room, you'll strip down, you'll get in your gym clothes. When she said strip down, I froze. I froze. I knew what would happen when I took off my clothes and stood there naked with my flabby body, my ugly, flabby body. They would laugh at me. That first Friday, I stripped down quickly. I tried to get in my gym clothes, and that's when it happened. I grabbed the jock strap. Now, the women will not understand this. The men will. Your mother tells you, when you put on underwear, make sure the label is in the back. <laughs> That's true for everything, true for everything, except for a jock strap. The label's in the front. I grabbed the jock strap, and I pulled it on backwards. The bellows of laughter that echoed through that locker room reduced me to tears. I was so embarrassed, so ashamed, I was so broken. After that, I was sick every Friday. I didn't say I pretended to be sick. I would wake up vomiting on Friday morning knowing that I had to go to gym. One day, I had finished English class and we were leaving and the teacher said, Guy Dowd, I want you to stay behind for a few minutes. I went over to his desk. He said, here's this poetry book. I want you to go to the back of the room and I want you to read this poem with all the emotion that you can muster. He said, I'll never forget the poem. It was Casey at the Bat. And I went to the back of the room and I started reading. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The scores stood four to two with, you may know the poem. 
and I poured myself into the poem. And when I finished, he just sat there. It seemed like he sat there forever staring at me. And then he said, Guy Dowd, I knew it. You are a poet. When he said that, tears started running down my cheeks. I felt myself trembling. I hurried out of the room and leaned against the wall, still crying. And I didn't care who heard me. I said out loud, when I grow up, when I grow up, I'm going to be an English teacher. A young kid who felt like nothing, whose life was changed, because a teacher showed some concern to an emotionally battered little boy. I mean, you can speak with the tongues of men of angels, and I pay Pentecostal friends do, but if you don't have love, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You can have the gift of prophecy, says the scripture. You can have the answer to all the mysteries of the universe if you don't have love. It doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't amount to anything. The gospel says Jesus is this, to love the Lord your God, to allow God's love to flow into you and to flow out of you, to embrace other people. And it comes not by believing doctrines, but by surrendering to the resurrected Jesus. He's here. He's now. He wants to invade you. He wants to possess you. He wants to sensitize you to the hurts of people round about you. And the last thing, it's, it's concentration, it's concern, it's commitment. 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 We live in an age where there isn't much commitment. That's why divorces are so frequent. That's why kids, instead of getting married, just live together because they don't want to make the commitment. Do you love John? Yeah, I love John. I just, I just don't want to get tied down. Did you ever hear that line? I just don't want to get into that kind of commitment. Love. Love creates concern, concentration, commitment. Commitment. I... Uh, I teach at Eastern University, a Christian university, just on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Making you into 
somebody who's concerned, somebody who knows how to concentrate, and somebody who's committed. We come here on behalf of World Vision, I wonder if you talk about Jesus. They're always disappointed because I don't talk enough about World Vision because Jesus is much more important than World Vision. Amen? Amen. But they bring them here because they want me to have you become concerned. Concerned about a child in a third world country. They have these packets. <coughs> they look like this. This little boy is uh, Stephen. He's eight years old. He lives in Uganda. Very, very poor. Neither of his parents had jobs. Whether he goes to school, whether he gets the medical care that he needs, whether he has a future, he depends upon whether somebody says, I think I'll support Steve. It's how many dollars a month? Thirty-nine dollars a month. That comes to about a dollar thirty a day. Chances are almost everybody here can come up with a dollar thirty a day. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you completely changed a person's life? When was the last time you did something that altered the trajectory of a kid? Changed the chick kid's life. When was the last time? Well, I tell you this. You can do that today. You'll we'll change that child's life. A child will get evangelized, get educated, will have a future, will get the medical care. You can write to the child, the child will write back to you. It'll make a difference in that kid's life that you couldn't possibly imagine. You won't even miss a dollar thirty a day. That's less than you pay for a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. And you can change a kid's life. You know, I speak mostly to college students, so that's why I'm so glad to be here. I, mean, I get tired of college students. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll see a college student, and, and, and they're they're in love, you know, they're romantically turned on, they're holding hands the whole time they're speaking and looking at each other. You, you know what that's like. Looking, like dying cows in a hailstorm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They'll say, you two there. You two there. Why don't you go together and support a child? Think of it. You can write home to your mother and say, Mom, John and I have a child. You don't know <laughs> Some of the old hymns around here. 
Because the old hymns say things that need to be said. I'm pressing on the upward way. And you remember that new height sign came in every day. And once in a while, some snotty sophomore says, I know, I know non Christians to live better lives than you live. And I always say, So what? If they're so wonderful without Jesus, imagine what they'd be like with Jesus. And if you think I'm so rotten with Jesus, Imagine what I would be like. <laughs> this is a small step. It's a step in the right direction. It's changing your kid's life so on judgment day when he says, I was hungry, did you feed me? You know that passage in the 25th chapter of Matthew. I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was a stranger, did you reach out to me? You'll be able to nudge the kids. <laughs> and if there is such a kid, the word will be well done on the open faith of Satan. And he can keep it. For in as much use this book as you did it to the least of these, you did it to the least. Several of my students work in Haiti. I go down and visit them. <coughs> they drove their van to the front of the Holiday Inn where I stay in for the prince. I got out and was walking across the sidewalk and I got intercepted by three girls. I called the girl because the oldest was 17. And she said, Mister, for ten dollars you can have me all night long. I was stunned. I looked at the girl next to her, I said, What about you? Do I get you for ten dollars? She nodded, yes. I split it to the third one, I do I get you for ten dollars? She tried to come across as sexy, but it's hard to be sexy when you're 15, and your mother and father are dead, and you've got a brother and sister that you've got to feed, and you have no way of getting the money to feed them, except to sell your body. I said, you're in luck. I'm in room 210. You'll be up there in a half hour, but not before. Do we understand each other? Not before. I'm hiring all three of you for the night. I rushed up to the room, I got on the phone, I called down to the concierge desk, I said, I want every Walt Disney video, every Walt Disney DVD you've got in stock, stock. ship them up to room 210. Called down to the restaurant, I said, I want banana splits. Do you still make them? I want extra ice cream. I'll pay you extra, but extra ice cream, extra whipped cream, cherries, nuts, syrup, I want them huge, I want... I want four of them. <laughs> He sat, he sat at the edge of the bed. And we watched, we watched Disney until about one in the morning. And that's when the last of them fell asleep across the bed. And as I sat in that stuffed chair, looking at their little bodies flew across the bed, I thought to myself, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Tomorrow they'll be back on the street. Selling themselves with the dirty, filthy charms. There will always be evil men who for ten dollars will destroy a girl. Nothing's changed, I kept saying to myself. And then these words came to me. I don't know whether they came from God or me talking to God, I don't know. But they were clear. And words were these. But for one night, for one night, you let them be kids again. For one night. You gave them back their child. For one night, you let them be true. You did what you could. I'm here, pleading with you in the name of Jesus, to do what you can do and support a child. I said, there's a little form to be filled out when you get your child. You turn in the form, you'll get the packet. On these thoughts, you know, they say, well, well, we couldn't sell them, so we thought we'd give them away, you know. <laughs> so get yourself a packet. I think we did a good job on this DVDs. But that's not the important thing you should give, because Christ is more than you can give. Now, let me tell you how this is done. There is a table in the back, back there in the vestibule. This is such a 
Pike Place, Baptist Church. You probably go to the North Fix. <laughs> There are people there who will sign you up. When you turn in the form, they'll give you the packet. Now, we get upset because a lot of people say, uh, listen, uh, I'll take it with me, I'll mail it in. You're kidnapping a child. We find that almost half of those who do that never turn in, never send it in. So please, if you're going to take a child, fill it up. I'll stay here a little while, and there's a place where I can sign this. See, what's the point? They sell better at garage sales at this <laughs> Well, in the name of Jesus, I call upon this for the child. Now, let me end this by telling you that you've been a lovely congregation. The problem is you're overwhelmingly white. So glad to have at least one face that isn't white. Because I belong to a church where I'm the only White guy. It's a large church, 1,500 on Sunday morning in each of the services, and I'm the token. And it's fun to preach in my church because black people know how to encourage a pastor. <laughs> even, even when I'm not doing well, one time I was halfway through a sermon that was going nowhere, absolutely nowhere, and I heard somebody in the back yell, Help him, Jesus, help him! <laughs> He had the title, but Moses 